Want to know how you can gain access to capital to jumpstart your journey to entrepreneurial success for entrepreneurs who are just starting out or those who have been in business for years? Minority Business Access is your podcast. Welcome to our show, where we will guide you in avoiding the pitfalls and thriving in your chosen business. Now, on to the show with your host, Solomon Ali. Welcome to Minority Business Access, MBA. We're really glad to have you here today, and I'm excited to be here. You know, as a black man, every day that you wake up, or as a black person every day that you wake up and you're not six foot under, that's a beautiful day. And it's starting to be more apparent in the current times that we're living in that it, evidently there's a price on our head and they forgot to tell us about it. You know, I, I really, really, my heart goes out to George Floyd and his family. That was an absolute horrific crime. That was murder. And I would say the peace officers that was standing there with him were an accessory to murder. If that was you and I, we would have been accused, all four of us, of murder. All four of us. There wouldn't have been any doubt. There wouldn't have been any questions. See, and that's what we're talking about. That's the things that we're talking about where it's so unjust. It's so unfair. You know, this happens to a black man and it's like, oh, status quo, protocols, Okay, everybody comes out. But when it happens to them, all of a sudden it's, well, we got to follow these policies and procedures. Well, that's okay. When it happens, why don't you follow the policy and procedures when you're looking at us? When you're telling us for no reason to get on the ground. When you're pulling us over for no reason. Why aren't you following the policy and procedures then? When you're pulling your weapons out for no reason, where the white man does the same exact thing, okay, and you wait patiently, calmly, and then handcuff him when he has a weapon. But with us, if you think we have a weapon, you start firing. This is ridiculous. If you are afraid to do your job, then you need to go find another job. If you are unable to do your job without the biases that you have, you need to go find another job. Because that's definitely what you guys tell us, that if we can't do it, you know, if it gets too hot, get out the kitchen, all that other good crap that you like, like to spill. So, you know, I'm unnerved. I'm angry. Okay. I'm upset. Because this just keeps going on and going on. You know, we've had 400 years of oppression, okay? And everyone acts like we're not being taken advantage of. We're not being oppressed. People, I want you to understand something. I'm trying to bring access to minorities because I woke up one day and found myself in a fight with the SEC, not a fight of my choosing, a fight that they picked. And what I realized, and it was this, God showed me something that I didn't pay any attention to, didn't know, was too busy going on about my lives. And see, that's part of the problem. We need to stop going on about our lives and start thinking about my brethren, and whether that brethren is a black brethren, a white brethren, a Filipino brethren, a Chinese brother, whatever that brethren is, we need to think about other people. We need to really think about other people. Because if we think how we want to be treated and treat our neighbor like we want to tr be treated ourselves, not give that good lip service, but truly Treat your neighbor how you want to be treated, okay? Now, I woke up, and going back to this, I realized that there was 5 million companies in the United States, 5 million companies in the United States with 10 or more employees. Of that number, do you hear me? Of that number, there were less than 100,000 black-owned companies that had 10 or more employees. Less than 100,000 out of 5 million. Do you think that's by coincidence? No. 
Now, let's break it down even further. There's 13,000 publicly traded companies throughout all the different exchanges. Okay, and that's counting OTC markets, Pink Sheets, New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ. So all the different exchanges, there's approximately 13,000. Well, here's a number that's going to surprise you. There's only 13 black companies that are managed, owned, or controlled by blacks. You should be outraged. You should be totally outraged because what that means to you is this. You do not have access to the capital markets. You do not have access to the monies to keep your businesses going, okay? You do not have access because they don't want you to have access. And why don't they want you to have access? They don't even know. They always rely and fall back to, well, that's how it was. Well, let's change it. We put people in office, let's change it. Congress, you're sitting there, let's change it. Let's create some programs and let's get some more black companies because also according to their own census, as far as the government labor statistics, right? Here's the thing, companies tend to hire their own. So if that's true, that means 13,000 companies are favored to hire people that look like them, to look like them, not like you and I. So that means there's only approximately 13 publicly traded companies out there that will be hiring people that look like you and I. That's a disadvantage. That's an unfair playing field. That means my kids don't get to go to the best schools. That means I don't get to live in the best neighborhoods, wherever we call the best neighborhoods, okay? Because I know what some of you think, all right? But the best neighborhoods are where the wealth is so that if we can create our own wealth, all right, and we know about Greenwood, okay, and we know what's happened there in Black Wall Street, we know about all this stuff where they burn it down to the ground, all right? So I'm not going there yet because it's not time. But it is time that, hey, I saw a demonstration yesterday right in front of my home, right where I lived at. And I took a lot of pictures of it and videoed it. And there's a lot of white people live around me, a lot of white people, and a lot of very affluent people that look like me. And so we were out there and everything and everybody, and it was a very peaceful, peaceful situation. But, but here was the thing that was unnerving. Okay, here, here's what was unnerving. When you look at the U.S. Bureau Labor Statistics, Black men, 16 to 19, 23%, 23.3% unemployment. White men, 16 to 19, 12.2% unemployment. Do you start to see where the disadvantages are taking place? People. That means our young people are not able to get jobs. They're not able to do certain things so they have what? More free time. They're not able to go and buy some of the things that they may want to buy as young adults or teenagers, all right? Now, let's go further. Ages 20 to 24, black men, all right? I'm talking about specifically black men, okay? 14.9%, 14.9% people. You know what it is amongst whites? 6.8. So we're in the double digits, 6.8. What... What that's telling you is they're getting a head start. They're getting a head start. They're getting a jump on you because now they've been working longer. They have more time to save, build resources. They're getting a head start in a lot of ways because we all know about Social Security, although I personally don't think it'll be around. But if you start working before I did, right, that means you've paid into it longer. So your benefits are going to be higher. So let's keep this real, people. This, this is not a joke. It, it's time to get very serious, and it's time not to just keep, I don't, I don't want to say just keep marching, but, man, it, it's time. It, it's time. It's, it, it's go time, okay? 25% 
I mean, I'm sorry, 25 year olds to 34. Black unemployment, 8.2%. White unemployment, 4.1. 4.1. 4.1. So what that means is 34 years of age, we're unemployed. That means we can't take care of a family. In our prime years, we're not able to be able to start living, to take care of a family, to have decent wages. We're stressed and burdened by the problems of the day. If I go on the streets and walk my neighborhood at 11 o'clock at night, am I going to be accused of something that went wrong in the neighborhood just because I'm a person of color? Are the cops going to pull me over? Because they're going to, you know, the standard, what they love to say, well, you look like someone or you fit the description of someone who did something. Fit what description? And see, we're never given the benefit of the doubt. We're automatically accused of being less than liars, um, crooks, thieves. But they forget. They're the ones that painted this stereotype of us. It wasn't us that painted the stereotype. The people that I know that look like me are some of the most compassionate human beings on the earth. Okay, And I'm sure you would agree with that. Now, all that being said, listen, folks, we got to wake up. I I watch the demonstrations, and I'm looking at them, and you know who I see out front? Women. Women. And yes, it's our mothers, it's our sisters, our aunties, things of that nature. But don't say I'm a black man and sit in the background and let a woman fight your battle. Get out there and fight the battle. Lead from the front. Give them something to follow. It's time for us to get serious about our business, people, our business of living, our business of our human rights, our God-given rights. Now, I don't want to sound like no angry black man because I'm not angry. I'm upset. I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scared for all the young brothers and sisters out there. I'm scared for my grandson. I'm scared for my daughter. I don't want people to have to go through what I've seen. I don't want them to go through what you're seeing. And a good way that we can possibly change a lot of this is we need jobs. You know, we're, we're in this time right now in 2020, we're, we're dealing with COVID. Unemployment is higher. So these numbers that I gave you were from the U.S. Bureau of Labor, and that was the first quarter. All right? I'm speaking to you now, and we're in June. Okay? So those numbers are probably doubled, if not tripled, that right now. If we don't have jobs, what are we to do? Society is changing right before our eyes. And listen... I'm going to be real. Here's the thing. I want you guys to understand this, and I want you to understand and listen well. The majority of the jobs that people had before COVID-19, they will no longer have, okay? And that affects us. That affects us. And I I want you to really think about that and let that just soak in for a minute. People who had jobs prior to COVID-19 will no longer have jobs. The majority of you will not have jobs. Our unemployment right now is roughly at about 40 million people. That's approximately what it is currently today, approximately 40 million. Now, many of you who constantly watch Minority Business Access know that I have said this number is going to reach 65 to 75 million people unemployed. Okay. We've never seen that. That's going to take us to the haves and the have nots in a major way. And if we don't put our foot down and start taking up for our human rights right now, 
What do you think is going to happen to us in the years to come? How much more horrific is this going to be? It's going to be unimaginable, the things that they will do to us and how they will feel that they have the right and just to disregard us because they're able to um, provide and make money for their families and things of that nature and to treat us like garbage because in a system that we've been fighting and trying to survive in that's been stacked against us from the very beginning. Okay? And we keep overcoming, but every time we overcome, they put their foot on our necks and try to snuff us out. And that's exactly what they just did to George. They snuffed him out. They snuffed him out. He knew people were videoing this with their cameras and things of that nature, but he did not have a conscience and he did not care. It meant nothing to him. He believed that he was above the law. And those people standing around him that called themselves fellow peace officers were just as wrong. They were not upholding justice. They were being an executioner. Call it for what it is. That's what they were doing. That was a modern day lynching. And if you don't think it's going to get worse when you see unemployment at the highest levels and people are worried about how they're going to eat. And we got someone talking about racism and what it is and what it's not and not acknowledging that there is a problem. The best way to have a problem is to keep acknowledging that one doesn't exist. Only a fool does that. We need to get to the bottom of this as Americans, as the greatest country, and we need to work through this quickly. Or oh, my fear is we will have civil unrest. Because you can't have the haves and the have nots because we know from history Every country that has experienced civil unrest, it was because people were starving. People were hungry. People didn't have jobs. Let's not let that happen to America. It's time. It's time. People, I've gave you the stats. Those are not my stats. That comes from the U.S. Bureau of Labor. That's their stats. That's what they're saying. That's where we are in the first quarter. People, that number is probably double, if not triple by now. And it's going to be a lot higher. What do you think is going to happen when black men can't feed their families? When white men, poor white men, because see, they think this won't happen to them. But it's going to happen to anyone that doesn't have the means to feed their families and to take care of their so-called responsibilities because they're not going to have a job. And we know what happens when everyone is out of a job. We turn against each other. We turn on each other. And we can't afford that. They're not talking about the right things right now. We need to start talking about the right things. And the right things is, hey, what are we doing as a society? Because we can't keep treating black folks this way. We can't keep treating black men this way. We can't keep allowing it to go on, allowing it to happen. And let me tell you something. If I got white folks that love to listen to MBA Minority Business Access, let me tell you something now. I'm talking to you. If you stand there and allow an injustice to go by, you're just as guilty as they are. You're just as wrong as they are. When you see injustice, you need to stand up for injustice. You need to fight. And I don't mean fight physically, I mean fight the system the way it was designed for us to fight. See, we all act like we don't know our Constitution. Our Constitution said if we have a corrupt government, 
It's time for the people to take that back. See, we didn't put you in office to be in office to serve, to be self-serving. We put you in office to serve the people, to provide some wisdom and some guidance so that we can all live the American dream, all live a quality of life that God has given every man. They said that now. I didn't say that. So don't come calling up Solomon and saying, Solomon, you're trying to start something. Solomon's not trying to start anything. Solomon's trying to tell you in the Constitution, it states, if the government is corrupt, the people have a responsibility to take it back. That's our responsibility. It doesn't matter if you're white, if you're black, if you're Chinese, if you live here in these United States under these rules and under this constitution, you have a right to do what's right and to take them out of office. If they're not going to do what's right, we must do what's right for our families, for us to survive. People, this is critical. I love each and every one of you. I have white brothers that I love. I have black brothers that I love. And I have everything else in between that I love, okay? So I'm angry, I'm upset. And I know a lot of you are upset as well. You know, I grew up until I was about eight, somewhere between eight and 10 in East LA. 68 in San Pedro, Los Angeles, 68 in San Pedro, right down the place from um, Bethune High School at the time it was called. I don't know if it's still called that now. And, you know, never really got in a fight and anything like that. We did what kids and everything did, okay? Parents wanted to move me to a better neighborhood, okay, so I wouldn't get in trouble and, all right, well, I'll go to a better neighborhood, move us to a predominantly all-white neighborhood. We're the only black family in um, our block, okay? Go to school every day. I'm getting spit on, all right? So I have to fight. I get in trouble. White kids never get in trouble. They were always telling the truth. I was always the one lying. And hasn't much changed, hasn't changed since. Um, they tried to dump me in the toilet. Three or four of them tried to dump me in the toilet. And they think it's fun. And it's a joke. And I'm fighting them. And, I, you know, they couldn't get me in the toilet. So I guess I did a pretty good job. But I'm the one sitting in there getting suspended for a week for three, four people jumping on me trying to put me in the toilet. None of them got suspended, none of them, none of them. And then I get in trouble when I get home for fighting. Parents didn't really understand, hey, you know, why couldn't you walk away? You know, I'm a kid. How, how in the world you walk away from three, four people trying to pick you up and stick your butt in the toilet? But I understand my parents were probably a little afraid of them too. Didn't want to rock the boat because we were the only black family in our neighborhood. So I understand that they probably had some fears and some insecurities. And so you learn to have to try to deal with things in a different way. They calling me gorilla pad, touching my hair, all kinds of things, right? Doing horrific things, just horrific. Get to um, middle school, here's what we're doing. They come pick me up, all of a sudden they like me now. We're playing sports. See, you know what happens in middle school. You start really playing sports, right? So all of a sudden everybody likes me. This guy, he's pretty good out there. He's a natural. They stop at their friend's house, get drunk before school. Now, we were in about sixth grade. Understand what I'm saying. We're in sixth grade, so what is that, about 12, 13 years old? They're stopping at school getting drunk. Now, that was something I couldn't even imagine, couldn't conceive, couldn't think of. But that's what they're doing. 
getting drunk, getting high, doing drugs before school, not getting suspended, not getting in trouble. But here it is, if a person of color in that school say one thing, they're out. Well, you know, go on. I, I remember trying to ask this girl um, to go with me. We call it going around at that time. And she was a white girl. And it was like, well, so she went around with me for one hour. And she couldn't, under, she couldn't stand everybody making fun of her and things of that nature. Nobody really made fun of me or came to me with it because I guess they knew that, hey, he'll fight. He'll fight. Not, not that I condone violence, but people, let me tell you something. Sometimes you must stand up for yourself. Because if no one else will stand up for you, you must stand up for yourself. Now, don't, don't take it the wrong way. My name means peace, Solomon. Peace. Okay? I'm a peaceful person. I'm a gentle soul. I don't back down from a fight, though. And I'm telling you, we can't back down from this. We got to hit this head on. So I'm calling on my black brothers, my white brothers. We got to hit this head on. And brothers, no more letting our women be out there representing the majority in any demonstration. In any demonstration, let's get out there. Let's join them. Let's make sure that we're the majority. Let's give them something to follow. Let's give the world something to see. You know, we, we like to make and say these sayings, but each and every one of you were created and made by God. Is a man of God. You're in his image. We weren't designed to be less than. Each and every white man was made by God and also made in his image. They weren't designed to be less than neither. But here we are. A house divided will not stand, as we know. A house divided will not stand. But this is what I do know. I'm not going to allow anyone to treat me any kind of way. It doesn't matter if I win. It only matters what? If I fight. And again, I ain't talking fight meaning physical. Because there's different ways to fight. We have a loss. Sometimes you have to take it to them that way. Now, George Floyd, he died. He died. And God allowed us to see something. And he, God, woke us up. He woke our conscience up. The conscience of this nation, he woke it up for us to address a problem that we have currently that's been going on and going on and everybody keeps sweeping it under the rug, saying, oh, just go along to get along. Oh, it'll be okay. No, it's never going to be okay until we change it. And if you ain't willing to change it right now, then we got to do what the Constitution states. That's where we are. Because there's no more of this go along to get along. It's no more that you're going to treat us fairly, that you're going to treat us right, that you're going to be correct and do right by us. Because you haven't shown that. You keep hiding. You keep hiding behind the politics. You keep hiding behind the policies and the procedures. Treat your neighbor as you yourself would want to be treated. That's all we're asking for. We're not asking for anything more or less. Stop judging us. Stop murdering us. Stop depriving us and our families. Stop trying to turn us against each other. 
Stop labeling us as less than, as thugs. We are people. We are human beings. And we deserve to be treated so. This is tough. And see, I know what's coming. I know what's coming because I'm looking at the numbers, people. I'm looking at the unemployment numbers. I'm looking at what's going to happen when you have haves and have nots. I'm looking at, and see, I want you to understand something. The haves are not worried about you and I. And see, a lot of the middle class white folks don't understand. The haves ain't worried about them neither. Because guess what? They're going to be in the not section. See, everybody that's in that middle class, that middle class is about to be wiped out. So when they wipe it out, please understand, it's going to be now them looking to blame us for taking jobs or things of that nature that don't exist, not even for us. Because, see, they got to blame someone. And who's always to be blamed for what's going on? It's always us. It's always the black man. They've divided our households. They've given us handouts. One of the worst things that I, I, I've ever seen in my life was welfare, right? And although the majority of the people on welfare are white, not black, they portray it that the majority of the people on welfare are what? Black. And so they keep portraying it that way until we felt guilty or whatever it may have been, and we stereotype. But it wasn't true. It was a lie. Majority of the white folks are on welfare. Now, moving on from that, then they turn around and say, well, if you're on welfare, the man can't stay in the household. What kind of crazy stuff is that? See, people, you got to think about a system and what it's been designed to do. It hasn't been designed to unite your family, to hold it together. It's been designed to tear it down. So when you're fighting a system like that, you got to be prepared to be all in. You know, some of you already know. Look, I'm Solomon Ali. Out of 13 um, publicly traded companies of that 13,000, I've sat on the board of directors of three publicly traded companies, been an officer of three, and raised capital for those three companies. And two of those companies... One was around the fifth largest uh, minority energy company in the United States. The other one deals with smart home technology. We own it. We control that particular space dealing with that. And they said it couldn't be done. And people, it can be done. I use Amazon as an example um, because Amazon, the CEO, used to talk about for a while that, hey, don't ask him anymore when they're going to make a profit. He don't know. In about 14 years, 14 and a half years, they had lost money. So for approximately 14 years, they have lost money. Well, how do you survive if you're losing money for 14 years? You have to get capital. Anyone that's an entrepreneur today know this. You can't go to the bank and ask to borrow any money if you're what? not making a profit, if you don't have collateral or some form of assets to put up. You know this. So how did they survive? Well, let me tell you. When you are publicly traded, it gives you access to the capital markets. If you have access to the capital markets, people, you got a chance to grow your business, to develop your business, to correct the mistakes and things of that nature. Go through some of the learning curves that you may have to go through to become a successful business. But if you're not there, if you're not represented there, if you don't exist there, then that means our people will starve because we won't have the jobs that pay well. That means we won't have access to capital. We won't have access to loans, private equity money. We won't have access. 
But if we're there, we get the access. If we're there, what they may be afraid of is that we're competing for the same dollars. My people, I, I, I love you all, each and every one of you. And I pray that the consciousness that God has given each and every one of us, that we move and do something about it. I pray that my white brothers, that they will sit back and get to moving and start saying, hey, wait, hold on. You can't treat them like that. You can't. It's wrong. Not being passive about it anymore. Start speaking up. My black brothers, the same thing. Start speaking up. Say, hey, you can't treat him that way. You see another black man being mistreated, you got to get up and do something about it. You got to come to their defense. You got to help them. See, we can't sit back and just be happy that it wasn't me. You know, we all know that feeling. Oh, I'm glad it wasn't me that got pulled over, that's sitting on the side of the curb, laying in the middle of the street. A lot of us know. A lot, if we don't know and haven't done it, we know somebody that have experienced that. Because we all have family and friends. So it's time to start watching and looking out for each other. Being socially responsible for each other. If they're not going to take care of us and do the right thing by us, then it's time that we take a page out of history from Rosa Parks. Maybe we stop patronizing various stores until we get their attention. And yes, that might hurt and be painful, but it may be necessary to bring a change, especially when you deal with publicly traded companies. It's time, people, that we can't keep spending our money with people that don't care about what happens to us. We can't. If they do not care about us, why would I give them a dollar? I can't spend my money there. I got to spend my money where they care about me. I got to spend my money where they care about you. Let, let me tell you something real quick, because I'm, I'm running out of time. And, you know, I didn't mean to be so emotional. So I know this probably didn't come out right or the way it was supposed to come out. Um, you know, when they asked me and wanted me to do this, it was, of course, one way. But I know from me <laughs> doing it right now is kind of a different way. Um, and I ain't know all that would be up in me. But listen, our GDP is roughly about $27 trillion currently. $27 trillion. People of color, we make up approximately 5% to almost 7% of the GDP. Now, we have less than 5% um, ownership, home ownership right now in the United States. Less than 13% of the wealth in the United States. So how the heck are we spending so much money and everybody else owns everything, but we're spending the money and we're being killed on the streets. How is that so? You got to stop spending your money. Because once you do that, then they're going to care about your needs. They're going to care about your family. But as long as you're not willing to make that sacrifice and you just keep giving them your money, you're telling them you don't care about yourself. So people, let's wake up. If they treat us wrong and poorly, and there's people in office, and big business don't want to help and march and stand with us, then we have no business spending our money with them.
I want to thank everyone for tuning in to Minority Business Access. Um, if I have offended anyone, well, I don't know what to tell you. You just offended. Okay. But again, thank you for tuning in to Minority Business Access. And if I offended you, don't damn call me or nothing like that because I don't want to hear that shit. Okay. So everybody be blessed. I love you. I know God loves you. We're all in his image. Let's try to work this out and make America great the right way. You've reached the end of another episode of the Minority Business Access Podcast. Connect with us at SolomonRCAli.info to leave a review and access more resources. We hope you enjoyed this show and found great value. See you at the next episode.